Well, what can I do with that? Welcome, everyone. My name is Jeff Balzer. I'm the Dean of the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt and Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs. And this, uh, if we could have the first slide. I'm going to say a little bit about, and it's, it's an honor to lead off this discussion, about the personalization of health. And um, really what we think healthcare may look like, not just 10 years from now, but one to three years from now. And, um, you know, the first thing I'd like to do is say something about our challenges. Um, it's not good. And, um, you know, I do need to differ with Michael Moore. <laughs> Uh, we are just a little bit better than Cuba in terms of our healthcare outcomes. Um, but, uh, and we're 24th in life expectancy. So in about every health index you measure, um, we're pretty average or below average. Life expectancy, infant mortality, rates of heart disease, rates of cancer. Something is wrong. Now what we are winning is in is expense. Um, we're not first. Um, there is a territory called the Marshall Islands that is first, and that's where we tested the nuclear bomb during World War II. Um, so so I, I actually think we have a lot of work to do, and this actually just shows what healthcare costs in the United States compared to a number of other developed countries in Europe and Canada. So we have a delta of $3,500 relative to those countries per person, yet all of our outcomes are worse. We, uh, we can attribute that to a lot of things, higher costs for providers, higher costs for drugs, the friction in the system due to health insurance, but the bottom one is the key. In my mind, it's quality. It's how we take care of people in this country, treating the average, not treating the individual, overuse, underuse, a total lack of coordination in how we manage your care. So what I want to talk about, uh, today mainly is, at the, is the piece at the bottom because I think that's where the real opportunity lies. It's not just that we aren't getting the right care to you, it's that we make mistakes, some that are avoidable and some that aren't. Do you know that the fifth leading cause of death in America's hospitals is adverse drug events? 125,000 people a year die of adverse drug events in America's hospitals. That's something like 15 or 20 pe per, uh, people in each hospital. So it flies below the radar screen. But you know, if I told you, that's like 350 people a day, if I told you that a 747 crashed every day in the United States from this problem, people would be picketing in Washington, D.C. about adverse drug events. But it flies below the radar screen, yet it's a, it's a plague, in a sense, in terms, of how, in terms of what it's doing to this country. And there are many such examples where we need to make progress. In order, to, in order to make a difference, we need to start with a pyramid of how we can not just improve the way we pay for care, but how we deliver care. And at the, at the top is starting to actually focus on conditions and how we care for those conditions over time, not just reimbursing healthcare providers per click, per test, per procedure, per 15 minutes, but really how do we take care of your asthma for five years and what does that cost? The, the other area that we need to make a lot of progress in is the whole notion of how the healthcare team interacts with you and does that happen every six months or every year when you see the doctor, or does it happen all the time? And so per visit, medicine isn't the right model. And third, you know, we treat the average. Um, we don't treat the individual. And evidence-based medicine only gets us so far because the evidence says on average we should do this or we should do that, but on average doesn't quite get there if half of the people who take a baby aspirin to prevent stroke are getting no benefit. So what if you're in the half that gets no benefit? You're getting the best evidence-based medicine, but yet on a personal level, it's not helping you at all. All of that depends on a framework of healthcare information technology to really let the symphony work and have all of these things coordinated and work well for the individual. I wanted to say a little bit about how we access healthcare. This is 
This is a step forward. This is a, actually a healthcare clinic in a mall. Um, you know, you can go shopping, you can go to the movies, you can buy a car, and you can go in and have a mammogram all in the same morning. It turns out that people go and have that mammogram when they can do that in the normal process of their day. And it actually turns out we see better outcomes when people can really easily access their health care. It turns out that if you can do that over the web, you really see a pickup in how people access health care. And many health systems like ours are creating portals where patients can not only find information about health, but they can access their own health care records. And they can get their lab results and they can track their lab results, and they can interact with their physician or their nurse practitioner on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. We have over 125,000 people using this portal in our health system. This is what people want for how they access healthcare. The other thing that um, uh, having a platform of healthcare information technology does is it helps us cope with the overload of information. I know everyone sitting in this audience is brilliant. But even if you're brilliant, neuroscience um, tells us that we can only handle five facts as we're making a decision at the same time. And it turns out that if you look at what's happened to healthcare, when we passed the year 2000, it started to get to the point where more than five facts were needed for each healthcare decision. And by 2010, it's getting up around seven. And as the human genome, your DNA, starts to become incorporated into how we take care of you, it's going to go into 20 to 30 facts per decision. And no healthcare provider on their own is capable of delivering the best care to you without real-time decision support in their hands that helps them help you. So healthcare information technology isn't just having an electronic record to keep track of things. It's actually decision support at the point of care so the right thing can happen. Now, the other thing that having the right information in the right place at the right time allows is a system of care. Imagine if you were a violinist sitting in an orchestra and you had your music score in front of you, but there was no conductor. That's what healthcare looks like when there's no healthcare information technology with decision support tying everything together. So if, you tra so if you move that analogy of the violinist in the symphony to a patient in the intensive care unit who has pneumonia, and there are 15 nurses and five respiratory therapists and six physicians and all these people managing the patient, that's what it looks like, and can you imagine doing that without the right information in the right place at the right time? So let me give you an example of a patient in the intensive care unit. The, the second leading cause of death for patients in intensive care units who are intubated and have breathing tubes in is pneumonia. We call it ventilator-acquired pneumonia. And hundreds and hundreds of patients will contract this, uh, this illness in any given intensive care unit in a major health system. We know there are about seven things that should be done for every patient who's on a ventilator with a breathing tube in an ICU. Evidence, hard evidence in the literature, in journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, tell us that these seven things should be done, and they should be done at a certain time, at a certain frequency, and that will definitely impact and reduce the likelihood patients will get pneumonia. The problem is, is getting the symphony conducted. How do we get it so that everyone does that? So what we did was we created a screensaver. And because there are computer screens all over the ICUs now, we can actually flash this information so that everyone in the intensive care unit sees it. And you can see down the left-hand side is the, the patient's bed, and going across is the, are the seven things that need to be done. And green means it's been done, and yellow means it needs to be done, and red means it's late. Think about how the healthcare team looks at that, and they see a red, and they say, you know, that needs to be done. Or think about a family member coming in. Why is my husband's block red? That has a huge impact, having the information visible to the whole team on whether or not things get done, and they get done on time. And everybody knows what everybody's doing. So let me show you the impact of this. Um, in our system, 
we were seeing over 300 ventilator-acquired pneumonias a year. And believe it or not, that was actually good relative to the industry. Um, in about 2007, we rolled out the seven uh, evidence-based guidelines, but we didn't have the screensaver. And you can see that it dropped a little bit. And then when we rolled out the screensaver in 2007, look what happened. The number of ventilator-acquired pneumonias in our system dropped to just over 100, about a three-fold improvement. In one year, we saved $4.3 million, avoided over 100 ventilator-acquired pneumonias, and 16 deaths. That's pretty extraordinary, especially since, think about this, our system is about one-tenth of one percent of the hospital beds in this country. So if everybody did this, it wouldn't be 4.3 million a year, it'd be 4.3 billion a year. Comprehensive healthcare IT is only available in about two percent of America's hospitals today. So it's so important that we get this technology and this kind of decision support out into the healthcare system so we can have this kind of impact. Now let me give you another thousand. Think about the fact that most of us had never heard of ventilator-acquired pneumonia until we just had this discussion. Think about taking this and applying it to a thousand other things in health. I think we just got to 4.3 trillion. I think that helped pay for the health care reform bill. So I want to finish with a few comments about personalized medicine. And what is personalized medicine? Well, if you look at these two lovely little girls here in the middle, um, and let's say that something terrible happens and they both contract the same leukemia, one third of the time the chemotherapy will work, a third of the time it won't have any impact, and a third of the time it'll make somebody worse. So both girls given the same chemotherapy, one will get better and one will get worse. Even though that chemotherapy, on average, is the best we could offer. So the evidence says this is the right chemotherapy, but an in, at an individual level, it's not the right one for you. I already gave you the example about a baby aspirin and stroke. Look at this gentleman on the right. If he has depression, and he goes to the physician and, and they diagnose his depression, the chances are about 7 out of 10 that the first antidepressant he takes won't work. And then he'll try two more before he gets to the one that will work. Even though the first one that was tried, the evidence shows is the highest likelihood to work. If we knew that ahead of time, his risk of suicide during that time we're getting to the right drug would drop astronomically. So the need to really improve health by understanding the human genome, because much of this personalized direction of drugs and therapies to the right person is actually encoded in our DNA. You could then say, well, didn't they sequence the DNA 10 years ago? And the answer is they did. We've had the DNA sequence for 10 years. We just haven't known what to do with it, because the information correlating all that DNA sequence information to health and disease has been lacking. Um, this is a cartoon from the New Yorker in 2000 saying, here's my sequence, give me the right drug. And here we are in 2010, and I don't think anybody in this room can say that anything that's happened to them in healthcare has had anything to do with their DNA sequence. We're going to try to change that. And um, this is actually a quote from Francis Collins, the new uh, NIH director, where he says, if everybody's DNA sequence is already in their medical record and it's simply a click of the mouse to find out all the information they need, you need, then there's going to be a much lower barrier to beginning to incorporate this information into drug describing. The key is simply, it has to be simple for the healthcare team, for the pharmacies, for everyone to use this in a way that it actually helps patients. We're actually making progress. There are a number of centers, ours included, that are working together to collect large amounts of DNA and tie that to electronic health information so that we can actually figure out what the DNA sequence means so then we can say to you as a patient, it's actually worth it for you to have your DNA sequence because we can then give you the right information about what drugs to take, what drugs not to take. So right now what we're doing is building the library of information 
So it actually makes sense to have your DNA sequenced as part of your health care. We hope we can have that library built to the point where when the cost of DNA sequencing falls and is tractable for society, we'll be ready to support it. We think within the next year, DNA sequencing, whole genome sequencing, will be below $1,000. And at that point, um, it'll be reasonable, it'll be feasible to begin to sequence DNA as part of the normal process of healthcare. The, the best way I can explain it is a year from now, when you come in and I can say to you, you know what, we would like to go ahead and sequence your DNA. We don't know what we're going to use it for, but we know that there are certain conditions you may have in the future where it's going to guide the way we care for you. And one example would be if you have atrial fibrillation, which is one of the most common arrhythmias that patients have as they get older, up to 20% of the population have this arrhythmia. Almost all people need to have anticoagulants, Coumadin. What we would be able to say is if we have your DNA sequence information in your chart, when you come in and you need that anticoagulation, we'll know what dose to give you. Because it turns out you could be one of the patients that needs one-fifth or one-half of the normal dose in order not to have a hemorrhagic stroke when you're anticoagulated. You'd probably want to know that. I'd want to know that. So that's just one example of how having DNA sequence information in your electronic health record will help us not care for you at the moment you're sequenced, but actually preempt or prevent bad things from happening or guide us to the right drug therapy for you when you come in and need it. Preemptive genomics is what we're talking about. The other thing, of course, and what we all hope for is the ability to use your DNA sequence to guide you in selecting care and making decisions about nutrition. Um, and we will, at some point, you'll be able to interact with that electronic health record and you'll be able to actually get information that tells you you better watch your diet because you're 20-fold more likely than the average to get type 2 diabetes. And you really ought to go on a, on a very conservative diet at a young age. So that's a little bit later in the future, but it's coming. And I actually think that genomic medicine, while it seems costly, is going to dramatically reduce the cost of care because the overuse of drugs and therapies, when they're really not helping anyone, will diminish dramatically. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I enjoyed speaking with you today, and I'm excited about the rest of the presentations today.